if you're looking to secure an environment or still have a few questions about what all of these terms mean, stay tuned. We're going to talk about just a few of the things and how that all kind of feeds together and works together. So stay tuned. We're going to jump right to this. So illustrated here on the screen, here on the upper part of your screen really is, are some of those certifications or authorizations that you may hear within the industry. And it's important to note, for example, here FedRAMP, which is a cloud-based service, and RMF and FISMA, for example, all share very similar attributes. This one is FedRAMP, in this example, is provided by a hosting provider like uh, Microsoft or ServiceNow or Salesforce. There's many of them out there. And they provide this as a software as a service. So we can actually just write on here, um, just let's uh, mark that up a little bit. We'll just put here uh, software as a service. So this really is a software as a service model, okay? So up here where FedRAMP is. But here, this tends to be local. When you have these type of things, you may have a local installation <coughs> of some sort of enterprise service. It could be the exact same service, right? It could be, you know, that, well, it can't be Office 365 because that's hosted, but let's say ServiceNow, for example, can load local, maybe in a uh, virtual machine, right? In a VM or something like that. And it could even be hosted on a cloud in a VM, right? It could also be sitting over here, for example, we could have a VM here as well with that local application. But at the end of the day, it's still local, right? Meaning that it's not software as a service. Now, why am I going into all that detail? Because the control set here, RMF and FISMA, for example, are exactly like FedRAMP. So now, granted, there are some things up here in FedRAMP where there are more controls that are needed. So you may need more controls because you're a cloud provider and there may be some differences in the boundary, right, of how we're, you know, protecting this, right, the boundary uh, versus the way you have it installed at your local site. But at the end of the day, it's still built on the same core set of controls. So, for example, here, those controls, as you look down through here, let's make that... Uh, Actually, let's turn this guy to red. So these controls, a lot of them tend to focus here on NIST 800-53. So RMF, FedRAMP, um, if you're getting FISMA low, moderate, high, notice the similarities between high and moderate. You're going to see those inside of FISMA as well. So they're all kind of the same. They're all grounded right here inside of NIST 800-53. And I'm going to actually stay tuned. I'm going to show you what they call a crosswalk document that I'm happy to share with you, by the way. Just send me an email. I'm happy to send it out to you. But it's a crosswalk that kind of compares all of these controls. And you can see where this control equals that control. So anyways, there's lots of these control bodies. As you see here, we have HIPAA over here. Um, which is really focused on medical, right? You have a DFARS here, which is focused on contractors or CMMC, I believe is the new acronym for it. You have PII, of course, over here, which is giving you personal information, which is all over the market, right? And you're going to see, you're also going to see things like GDRP, GDRP, I think, not PR, GDRP. <clears throat> okay. And then you're going to have CUI, um, controlled unclassified information, all of those, and of course the cybersecurity framework. We talked about the risk management framework, and then FISMA, which is um, another type of certification or authorization. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But these are your basic control bodies. In fact, let's just go ahead and show you that crosswalk right now, and then we'll get into the bodies and what all this means. So this is the crosswalk, what they call a crosswalk. Now this happens to be version 21. So I've had this for, for many years, but you can see here the crosswalk itself, right? So I've 
over the years kind of mapped out these different control sets. For example, here's Cobit, um, which is an older control body. There's 158 of them. Here's what the Cobit control numbers are, and here's how they map back to NIST 800-53. Um, well, there's not anything in there. Here's uh, one for, I don't know what this is for, PII of 122. So there's lots of controls in here, but let's go just to the summary here so you can kind of get an idea here. Uh, first of all, you can see different levels of control. So this, this always changes, so this is not absolute. But here, for example, if you're doing a low environment, whether that's FISMA, FedRAMP, it's gonna be around 124. It's gonna be about 262 controls in moderate and about 343 controls inside of a high environment. You can see CSF, RMF is gonna be right in this, probably RMF moderate is where most people are, right around the 260 mark. And then you can see all the different mappings here. So let's look at the baselines here. These are actual controls and how many controls are found in there. And you can see like this one is NIST 866 for HIPAA, um, SANS, NERC, ISOs, all of them are all branched over in how many controls they have and how they apply to um, the NIST 800-53 framework. Again, back to that drawing. So this is a mapping document just to show you that yes, it's called SC13 here, but over in SANS, it's called CCS um, in high trust. It's called, which is a New York uh, body. Um, let me go down to some that you might, let me see, PII. Uh, so they're just, they're just mapped all over the place. So the bottom line is that um, here's HIPAA, excuse me, here's, yeah, HIPAA to NIST. So you can see here, um, the order here, what the NIST is, what the control numbers are, and what the HIPAA control numbers are. So this is just a crosswalk. You can get these from anybody, but so why does, why does all of this matter? Well, because these are the control bodies where we, we have all of the NIST security controls, 170, 800, 171, DOD, um, 8500, ICD, I want to say, 638, uh, I'm wrong, no. There's there's a number behind it, I, I just can't bring it off. This is the intelligence community. Can't think of it off the top of my head right now. But so there's multiple bodies, right, of these controls, but they all feed the same thing. As you saw with our crosswalk, they're all pretty much the same. There's a little bit of variance, but generally speaking. And what does all of that mean? Well, that means that you're gonna create a security baseline. So if you say to yourself, I want to be, for example, let's say that you want to have a security baseline right here. So you want to have a security baseline so that your environment complies with PII and GDRP. If that's what you need, you're going to need the controls here that deal with PII. So you're going to pull those from the control bodies, whatever they are, and then you're going to create your PII compliance. The controls are the things that are telling you what you need to do. So for example, in here, here's a risk assessment, for example. You can see, you can just see incident reporting IR5, track and document the system, incident response. Here's where it is inside of HIPAA. So this is what the control IR-5 is asking you to do. And then you have to, back to the drawing here, you have to do that in order to be PII compliant. Now, the authority to operate is a collection of these controls as well. So perhaps you're in DOD and you're using the old DOD 8500 controls. Now, DOD 8500 has now been replaced by the risk management framework, okay? And they're all pretty much uh, the same. It's moved over, they've converted all those, and you can see crosswalks on DOD 8500 to RMF, which is really a crosswalk back down to NIST 800-53, which is the basis for all of your FedRAMP activities as well. So there's a direct line, an indirect line, I guess, between DOD 8500 
and between RMF and FedRAMP because they're all kind of the same. Again, I can't emphasize this enough. They're all the same controls. Now, why would I do FedRAMP over local? Well, there's a lot of reasons why you would choose one over the other, and those are really business reasons. So you have to figure that out. But from a security perspective, remember that about, um, and we'll just write this down, about 50% of your controls are technical, and then the other 50% are process-based. Now, the most expensive controls are the hardest ones um, to kind of uh, do and to monitor and most expensive to take care of is the boundary, right? So this is a firewall for those of you that like my drawings. All right, so the firewall really represents that boundary, that security boundary that, that the bad guys sitting out here on the internet right they have to go through the boundary in order to get to you back here operating your business okay so that's kind of how that works right that gonna goes there so so these guys have to come through the boundary in order to get there and this is the most expensive thing to take care of is the boundary because it's always being attacked and you want to make sure that you set that up properly when you go to when you are in a local environment, remember a local environment, and maybe you're doing it as a VM here out on somebody else's cloud, you are responsible for the boundary and you're gonna have to pay the money to keep that up. Typically it's gonna be, you know, dependent upon the program, somewhere between a quarter of a million and up every year that you have to pay for that. Here, this is also the boundary and this is expensive to maintain as well. But in a FedRAMP environment, somebody else is maintaining that. So if that's Microsoft or Salesforce or ServiceNow, they're maintaining their boundary. You're not paying, you're paying for it in a monthly service. But think of it, FedRAMP may have, you know, a thousand different customers on a specific software as a service. They're protecting the boundary for all thousand. That cost is distributed a thousand ways, right? here when you're doing it yourself you are paying the full price every single time so when it's possible i always suggest to people once they understand what the controls are that they're all really based right here inside nist uh, now there are other control bodies i'm just highlighting nist but many of them are are that you see on the screen it's got a little messy are really based in nist once you understand that that's the core for everything you understand that the crosswalk goes through and does all these different bodies, then um, it doesn't really matter where your workload is. Then it becomes a business discussion on what is most cost effective for me to buy as a service in FedRAMP. Does my workload allow that? Or do I still go local? And then knowing when I go local, then I'm gonna have to pay all of this. Now, one last thing I wanna mention about this, when you have any environment that's ATO'd, you want to look up other videos that that talk about, and I have a couple on my channel as well, non-impactful change, okay? So, for example, one of the things about this is network switches, for example. So, for a network switch, this is an impactful change. If you go and if you have an ATO and you switch out, right you change your network switch you're gonna have an impactful change you're gonna to have to go back and redo your ATO which is going to be expensive non impactful change may be for example if you have servers in your environment and you want to add more disk capacity the disk capacity is going to be the same as it was before you're not gonna have an impact on your ATO then you don't have to do that so remember if you're going to be planning a local environment make sure that you plan for non-impactful change very very important